Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Speaking Legally, where the legal meets the cultural with attorneys Royce Russell Esquire and Edward Pichardo Esquire. We're excited that you are back with us again. I can talk today. So thank you to everybody that was sending me love and shout outs. I wasn't feeling too hot last week, Wednesday, but I am back and we are ready for another engaging and awesome show. So thank you for showing up. Remember to share this with your friends. Tell them about the this show airing at 4 p.m. every single Wednesday afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. So before we get started with today's show, I'm gonna turn it over to our co-hosts so they can each say hello. We'll start with Edward Pichardo Esquire. Go right ahead, Ed. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, once again, my name is Ed Pichardo. Uh, when I started this, good evening. Uh, nice to have you here uh, this afternoon. I hope you find our program informative. Hello? Uh, yes. We hear you, brother. We hear you. We hear you. I thought you was going to kick something in Spanish for us, bro. Did a little something. Uh, okay. I'll do more later. There you go. Well, welcome back, everybody. I'm Royce Russell, uh, attorney at law, author of Cardiac Arrest, the tactical guide on how to handle unlawful police stops. And, um, you know, there's much in the news about this subject matter. And we're here to break it down from a cultural and a legal perspective. And hopefully you can uh, be engaged by the information that we can bring forward to you about this incident. And hopefully you can be educated and informed. So uh, Dr. Grant, uh, I'll switch it over to you. Thank you, thank you both for being here as always with all the information that we share with our audience. So there's so much going on in the world. I feel like every time we have a show family, there's more things for us to talk about, but let me say hello to those that are tuning in. Romello, welcome. Hey Richard. Thank you so much. I know you were concerned about me, so I appreciate that. Hey, Deborah, thank you also for being here and tuning in today to today's show. So we're going to start with first playing what's new in the news. And both of our attorneys today have a lot to say about this particular unfortunate incident. Once again, are we really serious? Is this still happening in 2020, the month? Of, I, I can't even let me let's just go to the video and we'll show you what's going on. We warn you, this is graphic. So here we go again. It's so hard to watch this graphic film once again in the news with everything that's going on for them to use the excessive force. But I'm going to start with Mr. Edward Pichardo. You want to share your thoughts first and then we'll kick it over to Mr. Russell. Well, I'd just like to mention for the audience that it appears that that video was being taken by uh, Mr. Uh, Walker's uh, girlfriend, but there's another video that uh, actually shows even clearer footage of what occurred. I believe that was taken by a uh, 
bystander. I mean, this incident is is very interesting in so far as how it started. Um, apparently, Mr. Walker, his girlfriend, and the children had finished um, returning a rental car back to the agency that they rented it from, and then they were able to secure a ride from someone who they were going to pay to take them back either to their vehicle or home. And once they enter the vehicle, um, at some point these officers approach the vehicle and because I believe there was a broken tail light on the vehicle, but they, they approach the driver, but then they also approach the passengers of whom Mr. Walker is one of them asking for identification. And Mr. Walker responds, why, why do you need identification from me. I'm not the one who's operating the vehicle. I'm not the one who owns the vehicle. What do I have to do with any of this? And at some point he gets out the vehicle either ordered to by the law enforcement officer, so he gets out on his own. And then that's when this whole thing starts where they're trying to detain him, handcuff him. He ends up on the ground. You know, he's accused of, of trying to bite these officers. And that's the reason that the officer is given for repeatedly punching him. Um, it's just it's just amazing how this spirals out of control. And it's part of this pattern of these things occurring as a result of some traffic related incident. And, you know, a broken taillight is at best a ticket in every state. I mean. How do you get to that to then the next thing? And, you know, I'll allow my, my colleague Royce to talk, my partner Royce to talk more about the uh, what's happened now since uh, Mr. Walker has been uh, in custody. But, you know, this is uh, this is just just uh, amazing. And, and, you know, I'll be honest with you, I don't believe that they had that, you know, it was, you know, they had any legal justification for asking Mr. Uh, Walker in particular for identification, much less him having to get out of this vehicle and be subject to a search and seizure, a constitutional search and seizure at that point in detainment. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. It's beyond amazing, Ed, and we're going to let Mr. Russell chime in on this. It's so disturbing and it's disturbing every time you see it, this repeated trauma over and over again. And the fact that we can see the videos that are captured, that was one by, it seemed like you said his partner and then somebody else caught another video. It, it, it's just too much. We're in the month of September in 2020 after George Floyd brought everything to head because it's nothing new to us. People are just finding out about what's going on. We're seeing this again. Mr. Russell, over to you. Yeah, first of all, uh, you know, I'm glad TMZ went uh, viral with it and showed the rest of the world. So we give them credit and we give credit for the bystander who uh, intervened, at least by showing uh, what took place. But, um, you know, now that we've seen the video, now we can exit. I'm going to ask you, Dr. Grant, to exit from uh, TMZ so so folks can focus in on, um, on what we have to say because uh, we need to break every single thing that happened down. Now we had scheduled, for those who don't know, uh, among the three of us, we scheduled a real different show uh, talking about many other things than this. But when you have incidences like this, we need to like really take it apart so we can give the education or the reinforcement of the education or the information um, that is necessary to do what I always say, be prepared, be protected and be empowered, right? And so, as Ed said, you know, the stop was pertaining to a broken taillight and pertaining to the driver. And as the facts, as we know it now, is the driver did not have a license on him. So you would think that would be the end all and be all, that the officers would focus in on the driver without a license and leave the passengers among themselves and not really deal with the passengers. Now, I don't know who interjected what, but at some point, uh, Mr. Walker was asked, Roger was asked for identification. Now, for everyone out there, there are some states that are called ID states, and that means you can get a citation. 
It might be a violation. It might even be a crime if you did not have ID on you. I don't believe Georgia is one of those. I know New York is not one of those. And Mr. Walker just asked, you know, why do you need my ID? How he asked it and what fashion he asked it, at the end of the day, it was a question and or a statement. But what I will tell you is that we all know, and I, I think it's uh, actually chapter, I'm gonna show the book because I think it's important if I can get it up here, right? There we go, cardiac arrest. It is chapter, chapter one, page 30, which speaks straight to the subject matter of how officers give orders and when you ask a question, it is not perceived as a question. It is being perceived as a threat or insubordination of some sort. So typically police officers that abuse their power often do not want to be questioned by citizens and view being questioned as a threat or insubordination of some sort. Clearly that's what took place here. He asked the question, they don't hear question. They don't want to hear question. And what they hear is challenge. And once they're challenged, then for every action, there is a reaction, right? And so when he asked, why do you need my ID? That didn't come across, no matter how nicely he would have said it, it didn't come across the way that the police officer wanted to hear it, right? And so it is important to understand that when you're dealing with police, it's important to understand that when you ask a question, how they're gonna perceive it. And therefore for every action, there is a, a reaction, right? And so in this particular instance, that's what we saw. And it led to a level for which excessive force was used. Now, I, I, it's important that we stop there because that's a teachable moment. You know, in this tragedy, we need to take away some of the things that we need to do to prepare ourselves. And Ed, you know this all the time, when police officers are going to effect an arrest and a bystander sees something, see something wrong and says something, or in this particular case, the passenger is asked questions knowing that he or she has nothing to do with the incident in and of itself, that the focus then shifts. And when it shifts, you could put yourself in grave danger. And this is what happened here, which led to him being beat. And I think that is, you know, I want to go to, I think it's chapter four. I want to say chapter four in cardiac arrest, which is important because it talks about, no, there is no law that requires you to have identification and you can refuse to provide ID, but police can never compel you to produce identification unless they have reasonable, reasonable suspicion to believe you are involved in illegal activity. So clearly he wasn't involved in any illegal activity and there's no right to produce ID. But once again, I will tell you for every action, there is a reaction. And so now as Ed, as you stated, he is removed from the car, right? And so, you know, when he's removed from the car, then this is where they claim and they charged him because you, you talked about what is the latest on him, right? The latest for everybody to know is that Mr. Walker was arrested and he was charged with um, two counts of battery against the police officer. And he was also charged with, I believe, obstructing or hindering the law. Now, for those that you live in New York, obstructing and hindering of the law is similar to uh, obstructing of governmental administration, which means basically the police say that you were interfering with something. And yeah, and they're interfering with their lawful duties that they're trying to carry out in the administration of justice. Yeah. Right. And so I asked this question to you, Ed, and I asked it facetiously. If the officers are stopping the driver because he has a taillight, how did you, if you're Mr. Walker, how did you? obstruct or hinder their pursuit of the law. Well, I, I, got, a, I got a feeling they're gonna try to come up with a fancy argument here and say that they weren't necessarily, uh, the, that the obstruction doesn't necessarily refer to what they were doing with the driver, but instead them trying to somehow investigate him and 
Well, the and reason you're not wanting to the reason uh, why I asked you that question. Request, I'm sorry, what? I said the reason why I asked you that question is because as you stand here or sit here on this video and you struggle with articulating, I mean it was it was it was intentional, right? As you struggle to articulate, what is the basis? This is the position that we want to be able to put the officer in to be able to say, well, what is the basis? Like I didn't interview you was asking him for information. I didn't say don't give it to him. I had nothing to do with it. You asking me for my ID and you want to say by me not giving you my ID, I obstructed in some fashion. Well, what did I obstruct? You knew nothing about me. You know nothing about me. So there is no obstruction there. And then as to the battery, we know, as you articulated earlier, they're going to say that him biting the officers alleging. And, you know, what this reminds me of is when police in New York City say, stop resisting, stop resisting. Meanwhile, they're beating the living shit out of you. Right. They like stop resisting, stop resisting. So you can hear. Well, 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 well in New York City, it's the famous uh, default. Uh, what they do when they're in the wrong, you get charged with resisting or obstructing um, conduct. Court, it gets dropped down to a disorderly conduct uh ticket which you know uh becomes a whole nother uh issue in terms of you even being able to take something like that to trial and not be able to possibly get a a, a, a jury but instead a bench trial it's it's a it's a real default position it also is used to protect the city later on against liability if the person does accept the violation to end the uh, repeated court proceedings. I mean, you know, the, these are all, all tricks. My, my, my theory here is that this was a pre, what they call a pretextual stop. You know, uh, they, they somehow maybe recognized Mr. Walker or had some idea that there was something going on there in terms of what later on became the issue in terms of once he ended up in jail, which are these warrants, you know, because a lot of black men get stopped simply for the purpose of the police uh, being able to run their name and say, oh, you got a warrant. Now we got to take you in. And I think that's what was going on here because they had no what you call Terry stop reasonable suspicion to ask for the identification. And what was the idea with the identification? You know, most of the time as well. Now that we got your ID or your name, let's run it. Let's see what we can get out of this, and 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 continue on with you know the the uh, the oppression. I mean, it's 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 unfortunate. I don't know if you want to talk now about what. You, well, you already mentioned it already. So, Mister Walker is arrested now. So now, uh, a probation, a felony probation hold slash warrant because. There's two different things operating here. If he hasn't been meeting with his probation officer or is somehow not fulfilling the obligations of his probation, then probation officers then will ask for a warrant to be issued to compel appearance in that PO's office or otherwise court to compel um, adherence to the uh, probation. Or if you get arrested, the probation officer gets informed of the arrest and then has to make the decision whether or not to place a hold. There's also a mention of a warrant. Well, the felony probation uh, charge is associated uh, reportedly with a cruelty to children charge and a possession of firearm by a felon charge. Then you got something appearing in the news about a failure to appear warrant coming out of a city called Apeville, which is in, in the neighboring county of Fulton County, because he was a resident of Clayton County. Can I stop you right there, right? You know, it's interesting that you mentioned the charges, right? They are what they are. But let's backtrack. One, uh, when Mr. Walker left his house, he doesn't have a stamp on his forehead that says probation. So there's no way for any of the officers to know any of that, right? I mean, you have to have a million, what we're going to call, quote unquote, I-card or facial poster descriptions out there that have to deal with uh, knowing who he is and knowing 
that he's wanted in any county. That's number one, right? So I, I can't even, I can't even begin. And not that you give him credit for can it. I, can I stop you for a second, Royce? Sure, sure. You said it's something. You said I card. Right. I'm gonna go back and explain that. Right. Okay. And, okay. Because you know, I'm and, pretty you know, sure a lot of people in the audience is like I card. What's that? Right. But just, just, just the the main point is that. There's no way he didn't walk out with printed on his forehead probation. Just like I don't walk out my my house printed on my head, lawyer. You don't walk out of your house, doctor. Doctor Grant doesn't walk out of her house printed doctor on the forehead. So this, you know, and I'm not saying that you're giving credence to it, but this assumption that you know he was wanted or something that comes way way after the fact. And you talked about pretextual stop. So let me define that and I'll define what I card me. So the pretextual stop, which which uh, uh, brother Ed is talking about is basically, it's a false reason to stop a car, is 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 fabricated. It's really based upon discriminatory racial profiling, uh, really nothing to do with whether or not you have committed a crime or there's reasonable suspicion to think that you're gonna commit a crime. However, uh, police officers are often given the latitude to create this fabrication, this lie, um, to say that one, a taillight was out, or to say that your license plate was covered so we couldn't really read your license plate, or to say that your windows were too tinted so we stopped you for the tinted window, or to say that you had an air freshener hanging from your, your mirror inside your car so we stopped you for that, right? And the only way they would know Her ability to see out of the car. Right. Yeah, right. right. And, and the only way that they would know that is that your window has to be rolled down. or I have to see you from the front. Rarely can you see it from, you see it from the back. However, these are the reasons they use to stop you. Then once they stop you, then you might get the fabrication of the smell of marijuana to get you out of the car, or you might get the the interrogation of let me see your driver's license registration or in this case when there isn't any driver's license on the registration let me find out who's in the back of the car so then they can run the license and so then they can see whether or not you have a warrant or not now oh no how about better yet we saw a bulge in your right. uh, pocket that right. may right. look like a weapon right right so there you know this pretext is what uh, Brother Ed is talking about. And in reference to an iCard, an iCard is usually some type of information, uh, data information that is put out in the community. The police know about it, that the police want you. You are wanted for something. There's a warrant for your arrest. You're wanted for an investigation. You may have committed a crime. And every state and every county probably has something different. But the point I'm making is, is that he did not have that printed on his head. There's no way that they knew that that was in his background. And when I look at the media, and I think I talk about it in cardiac arrest, but I surely talk about it and every time I do a workshop, is the assassination that takes place of the victim by way of the media. Now, no one has said anything about the officer's background or history. We don't know if he has a negative background, positive background. We know nothing. But what we do know is that everything that Mr. Walker was involved in criminally has run has come to the surface right and so they use words cruelty to children we don't know if that means whether or not he was you know he spanked his kid and somebody called next door and was like hey look he's spanking his kid so there's a charge called cruelty to children no disrespect to whoever the victims may be in that in that particular case but we don't know that but they put it out there to hopefully have those that are not um using critical thinking tools to say, oh, that was the basis, or he deserved it, or um, he's not a good person, and or oh, the police would stop him because they knew something about him. And all of that is false. And when we talked about last week and the week before about probate, probation and parole, here it is, live and in your face. I think you and I joked about it, and Dr. Grant, we joked about it. We said, uh, <coughs> you're getting ready to walk out because the judge says, I release you on your own recognizance. And then all of a sudden, somebody taps you on the shoulder and say, not so fast, buddy. You don't get a pass. You got to go back in. And you're saying, why I got to go back in? Because I have this probation or parole violation. And Brother Walker is experiencing that right now. Bond is set on him for $25,000. 
He's getting ready to leave jail, get ready to get out of here. And then all of a sudden, Fulton County says, all right, these are the warrants that we have for you. And depending upon how racist or how sinister or how connected all the parties may be, he might get violated because of these false charges. Because one of the things, you can't get rearrested, right? So because of these false charges, he might get violated and then have to go spend time. Wow. Well, let, let's just pause. This this is a lot for everybody to digest, especially since everybody's been watching the last two shows. If you did, where Mr. Russell broke down paro parole and probation and understanding what's happening. So what we see now is that one, he was a passenger. The passenger gets assaulted. Then the passenger gets charged. And now the passenger is arrested. And because he happened to have a probation situation, he might end up back in jail because he couldn't get arrested while on probation. So breaking down, it's like, I, I don't know if it's serendipity, it's sad serendipity that we were focusing on just explaining that where the legal meets the cultural. And now we have a case in the public eye that is going through exactly what Mr. Pichardo and what Mr. Russell has shared and educating us on the difference between parole and probation and how it can set people up for failure while on probation. Oh my goodness. And one of the things that I really want to point to is that, you know, one of the things I want to point to, I'm sorry, Ed, to interrupt you, but it's very important. Uh, and I'm looking down because I'm looking at cardiac arrest and I'm trying, every time I see an incident of false arrest or police brutality, I have to check myself to see whether or not I'm on point, whether I'm living in Long Island or Fantasy Island, right? And so right now I'm living in Long Island because I'm right on point, right? Not Fantasy Island. In chapter four, we talk about do not tell a detaining officer what he or she can or cannot do. If you are a victim of an unlawful stop, then what an officer can or cannot do is irrelevant. Is irrelevant. You telling the story of I'm the passenger in the back. Why are you talking to me? Don't speak to me. Is irrelevant. Now, I'm not saying don't say it. You have to empower yourself, but you have to know in your brain you have to know in your brain what is going on. And once again, knowing gives you more power than not knowing. Standing up for your rights and knowing gives you more power than haphazardly standing, standing up for your rights and not knowing. And so here's a situation where it didn't matter. And we have the end result. I'm sorry, Ed, you were going to speak to something. No, I think I think what this incident is reflective of is how the criminal justice system is really uh, how oppressive the system is and how much of a hold it has on a lot of our young black men in ways we can hardly imagine, you know, because the idea always is you do the crime, you do the time, you resolve your case, you should be able to move on, but instead you continue to be held and, and bounded by this system, even while you're, walk, you're you think that you're walking around the world free, and then all of a sudden it, it appears to pull you back, even when you haven't done anything. And then if you try to assert um, your legal rights, what your expectations should be, right? Because you know, a, a number of us agree that the criminal justice system is actually an unjust system and that a lot of these, uh, that a number, not all, but a number of these police officers are acting extra judicially. They're, they're, they're operating outside of the law and what they do is they use the law in ways that it's not supposed to be used. So, you know, earlier I mentioned and, and Royce mentioned the pretext stop. You know, I'm talking about I'm talking about, you're talking about having felon on your forehead. For a lot of these officers, just being a black man is, is, is the felon on the forehead. That's what it is. If you're dressed a certain way, if you look a certain way, and even then it doesn't help you out because if your vehicle is too damn nice and you have no right to be driving around in a vehicle like that, that then attracts this sort of attention where you get the question, well, who are you? Let me see your ID, your license. You don't, even though I don't have anywhere near reasonable suspicion that you violated the law or about to, but let's see what we can do. And even if we don't come out with anything, at least we've 
reminded you of who's in control and who's in charge. And, and you know, and then this incident spirals out of control. He's made bond, but now he can't get out because he has, you know, this probation issue and this other issue of a possible failure to appear. God knows what that's about, you know? And a lot of times here in New York City, people don't realize that, you know, this can happen to you right here in the Big Apple. Why? Because if you get arrested in Queens and you got something pending in the Bronx or Brooklyn or Staten Island, God help you. You could resolve your issue there in Queens and still be held because we now we got to deal with this other issue. And a lot, a lot of it depends on, like Royce mentioned earlier, what the authorities are doing with you and what the what the intent is at the end of the day, because some of this stuff can be resolved with simple phone calls. Hey, Department of Probation, do you plan on continuing these hold? What are you about to do? No, we're not going to do anything. We just want them to come in. Okay, fine. Drop the hold. Hey, Hateville, what's the failure to appear for? Oh, you know, it was uh, for, you know, a, a, a ticket for loitering. Okay, well, why don't you give them a new appearance date and we're going to drop the warrant and, you know, um, we'll let them know that his next court date is in October. All of this stuff can be resolved administratively depending on whether the authorities want that to happen. You know, you know what you what you mentioned in, in your dissertation, what you mentioned and, and let's let's pin this. This is a teachable moment. So everybody get your pens and papers, clean out your ears, open your eyes, come to realize all that hip hop from 1980s and, and back. Um, teachable moment. What you talked about is what we describe in cardiac arrest, classic cop, right? A cop that works on classism, right? We live, in a, we live in a world that's based upon class and social economic status. And what you also talked about is damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? You hopefully rise above the poor to hopefully one day move your family to a more influent area, you know, whether you're LeBron James or whether you're James Brown or whether you Leroy James, you try to move on with your life and then you reach that plateau that now you don't live, you know, necessarily in the projects. Now you live maybe in the suburbs. And once again, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. And what do I mean by that? Right. If you live in the projects, you're getting stopped because I can't stop you. I'm above you. That's what we do. If you live in suburbia, I will stop you. I can't stop you because you don't belong here. You shouldn't be here. It's amazing how people get stopped in the Bronx based upon this classism. For instance, somebody from Pennsylvania visiting somebody in the Bronx. Oh, to us, it seems normal and should be normal. To police officer, oh, that might be someone that's trafficking drugs. They're coming from Philadelphia to the Bronx. No, why can't I just be visiting my family in the Bronx? I mean, like, you know, come on, man. Give me a break, Jake. You know what I mean? That's what could be happening. But using the law to our disadvantage, which you spoke to, using classism and racism and profiling and quotas, um, you name it, um, to, the, to our disadvantage, you have a situation like this, which is not to our advantage, is always to our disadvantage. So and that's, it's important. Push your pin in that for me, Mr. Russell. I just want to expound on two things that we have some questions and comments that are coming in. And Deborah said, how can we stop this? Because innocent civilians get caught up in it as well. Uh, thank you for being here, Deborah. And Shawnee, the class is in session, always here. Let me just say that what you've heard both of our attorneys describe is what we're fighting in a more global way when it, we talk about reform, when we talk about equity, when we talk about what people didn't realize, air quotes, because you know sometimes people just turn their head. They knew and saw what was going on, but maybe not to the level. I'll give the benefit of the doubt to those who really didn't understand what was happening to black and brown people in this country because of the way it was framed, the way the media creates narratives about who we are as a people that, you know, it's all these bad people. You have to control all those black and brown people. They're the ones robbing, stealing, killing, like no crime happened in white America. But what's happening now is that you're learning about some of the legal specifics that are in documents that are law that need to be changed. 
because things were set up not for the success or the reform of someone who does a crime, serves their time. How do they go on and re-enter society? Was there really a plan for them to re-enter? Do we really want to see our community succeed? If we don't have attorneys like Mr. Russell and Mr. Pichardo working on our behalf to advocate and fight against the things that are systematically put in place as law to restrict us from growing, it won't change. So to your question, Deborah, how do we change? We change policies. We change who we elect. We go and vote. We fill out the census. We do the things that we currently have in place to affect change because this is not new. Unfortunately, people are just finding out about how deep systematic racism goes, how much we have suffered as a people, but now is the time for change. So change comes in a multiplicity of ways that people are advocating for. So there are numerous things that are on the table for discussion, but I am praying that as black and brown people, we don't get it twisted with working on each item some will be able to do a group at a time and some have to have singular focus so that we can see the results. We can't just get upset. We can't be traumatized over and over again, looking at video after video. We have to make change and speak where the legal meets the culture so you can arm yourselves with the right information, press the people who are in office to really effectuate change with changing policy and law that's written in the books designed to keep people where they are. I think I think one of the things I want to mention, get it. And I just want to mention that, you know, we have these two videos of what happened, you know, after, you know, they're they're trying to subdue, handcuff, whatever you want to call it, this, you know, having Mr. Walker on the ground. We haven't even seen if it exists, the body camera footage of the initial encounter. What was the driver asked? What was Mr. Walker actually asked, what was the interaction? That's going to be interesting, you know, because it's like, where does this all start? And then, you know, with respect to this other drama with, you know, the, the probation and the warrants, listen, a lot of, a lot of this stuff revolves around economics and money too. Royce mentioned last week, if you were listening carefully about the cost of probation, Okay. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people end up with, with, with warrants because they haven't paid some fees or something related to their probation. And then that ends up pulling them back into the, the, the system. And why haven't they paid the fee? Because they can't get a job. Why can't they get a job? Because nobody wants to hire you. First of all, being black is bad enough, but then you got the, 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 the felony on your record. Now what job am I going to am I going to be able to get? I can't get a loan to start my own business either. I mean, wh wh what is, where does that leave me? You know, and I'm, you're speaking truth to the air and I want to continue being a truth teller. Um, and I am going to speak to the fact that we have to recognize that we are not going to get over. And what do I mean by that? You know that you didn't show up for that ticket whether it was urinating in the park or whether it was not wearing your mask, you know that. And so now you're in front of this judge. You may have forgotten about it until they bring it up, but now it's brought up. You have to be responsible for your actions and lack of action. It's not going to disappear. It's not going to go away. And you spoke to the financial. There's one thing not to have. There's another thing that I'm not going to pay attention to it. I'm just going to ignore it. And anyone who's suffering from that, let this be a teachable moment that you can't ignore it. You can't decide that, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to show up today or I'm not going to show up today. And I'm too damn scared to show up tomorrow to let somebody know that I didn't show up the day before. You got to be brave enough to do those things because it will eventually catch up with you and try to change the narrative when it is not so. And I think we need to be mindful. Another teachable moment, the video. In cardiac arrest, we talk about when someone is videoing, you should try to maintain composure to be quiet so we can hear what the officers are saying. It's important to hear what the officers are saying. 
I do understand that you're in the midst of something that's going on in real time. So you might be traumatized. And so you start to react and your reaction might actually be intentional. If that I, if I scream loud enough and just say stop loud enough, they'll actually stop. Or I'm saying this to give them time to stop and watch them ignore me. However, the downside of that is that we can't actually hear. We being attorneys can't actually hear what is being said. In this case, we've heard a lot of what is being said. We heard him say, I'm going to die, Mr. Walker. We heard Mr. Walker said, I can't breathe. We heard the officers say or respond back as if they didn't care. And they didn't care. We heard officers say to the woman that was screaming, look, if you don't get that car out of here, you're going to be arrested. There was nothing with the car that was obstructing something or doing something that was impinging upon them, doing their lawful duty and how they speak to us. See, there was one thing to draw the line on excessive force, excessive force and false arrest. There's another to draw the line. Look, sir, don't even speak to me that way. Um, you're speaking to me in a manner as if you have no respect for me. Now, once again, for every action, there's a reaction, but that's a, that's the action I'm willing to take because I'm gonna let you know right here, you can't speak to me that way. That's, that's, that's just unacceptable. It's not, it's not going to happen. So let me let me ask you to push another pin in that. Because you said two things that I want us to circle back and I don't want everyone to miss. My father says it all the time. It gets on all of our nerves when he says it, but he's right. He says you get by, but you don't get away. If you have a fine, if something has come up and you need to make a court appearance, make the appearance. Don't avoid it. Don't ignore it. That's what Mr. Russell is just saying. Let's be responsible. Whatever it is, it could be something very minor. It could be traffic violations that come back to haunt you. Whatever it is that you have received some sort of summons, citation, anything for, handle it. It's better to handle it early than have to deal with it on the back end when it's used against you in situations like this. And then he's adding to it, when we talk about advocating for change, when we talk about what we can do, it's the way in which officers engage with those who they're to protect and serve. So talking to you in a rough manner, that doesn't happen in certain neighborhoods. It's, hello, sir, is everything all right here? What's going on? Not license and registration, please. There's a way to say and to do anything. So the training that everyone is throwing around is, oh, the police officers need to be retrained. And of course, let's put in the disclaimer, we're not talking about every officer. We're talking about those bad actors who are making it very hard for those who do their job each and every day, putting their lives on the line to protect and serve, to be in this global situation where everybody's seeing what happens with excessive force. But I want the community to listen. What you can do, write letters. You can talk to your elected officials in your area. What are we doing about this situation? What's your position on police reform? Where do you think we need to have the changes? And how can we empower our community that if somebody, and Ed, I want you to speak to it, doesn't speak English well, they get a summons, they get a citation, how do they handle it so they don't feel so nervous and they don't hide it and they don't answer it, and then it ends up coming back just in the way Mr. Russell just described. Ed, before you before you say it in Spanish, because I want you to add this too, um, look, we have to take a stand and I'm all for taking a stand. I'll be the first to take a stand. But you also have to know what weapons you have with you, right? You have to know what type of fight you're in, right? You don't bring a knife to a gunfight. You don't bring a, you don't bring, you know, a, a fist to a knife fight, right? You have to know what fight you're in. And so what I mean by the weapons, right? We have to know that a CCRB exists, a civil complaint review board in New York City exists. It might be called something else in Atlanta. It might be called something else in New Jersey or Connecticut. Or there may be some other mechanism for which you can complain. But you need to know that, right? Because then the conversation becomes different when an officer approaches you and is rude to you. You say, officer, look, I really you're rude. I really don't want to have to file a complaint with CCRB. Now, I would tell you right now, a lot of officers would be surprised that some folks depending upon the social economics of it, even know what CCRB is. And how nice would it be to have on tape or video, the officer said, go file your complaint. I don't give a fuck if you file your complaint. That's beautiful. 
I, I take that. I can work with that as an attorney fighting for your rights for a false arrest or excessive force. You gave him the opportunity to stand down. This is almost like, um, you know, Samuel Jackson or Denzel Washington as a negotiator. You're negotiating. You're giving opportunities for officers, the bad ones, to stand down. And for every time they, they, they discard the opportunity, it just brings value and, and, and empowers you to know that this is wrong and that someone like myself or Ed or any other attorney, and I want to give a shout out to attorney Williams. I think his name is Sean or Sheen, S-H-E-A-N, Williams, who's taken on Mr. Walker's case in Atlanta. And we need more faces because we need more faces doing the right thing. And let me just say one more thing. I'm sorry, Ed. To Deborah's point, as an attorney and Ed as an attorney, we have to start, if you have it, infiltrating our languages, our language and our arguments to the court with cultural information. Putting the court on notice that this is a cultural situation. This is a classic situation. The, the law is black and white. And folks are treating it just like black and white, which it should not be treated. It's much more flexible. And and before Ed, you jump in, CCRB, Civilian Complaint Review Board, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Want to make sure you know where it is, Civilian Complaint Review Board. We use these acronyms and we want to make sure our community understands what it means so you can look it up. But Man, you're going to get this Spanish out, Ed. Yeah, get this Spanish out. <laughs> you're going to get it. Well, 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 el mensaje que quería comunicar de la comunidad que estamos hablando ahora mismo es que si tú tienes que aparecer en corte, si tú tienes una multa, es mejor que tú bregue con eso inmediatamente si tú tienes una apariencia en corte, una audiencia que tú te aparezca para esa audiencia y aunque tú no tengas el dinero para la multa o tú tengas miedo de lo que va a pasar tú debes parecerte porque es peor si tú no te apareces porque después van a ponerte una guarante una pedida judicial una orden judicial para forzarte a aparecerte en corte contra tu voluntad, que tú vayas a estar manejando en tu carro, esté con tus hijos, o tu esposa, o tu señora, o tu padre, y que un policía te vaya a parar, y te corra tu nombre, y ve eso en el sistema, y te arreste, y después de ahí tiene que tu familia buscar a alguien, buscar la manera de sacarte de, de, de detención. Esas son cosas que uno trata de evitar, y ser responsable por sus asuntos. Um, I just was, you know, basically explaining to the Latino community that you know, you have to be responsible. You have to show up for your court dates or pay fines. It's it's worse or deal with the fine. It's worse not to deal with it. And then later on, you're in the street with your family, your loved one, whatever, and a traffic stop occurs. They run your name. And then all of a sudden this comes up and now you're detained and your family's trying to figure out a way to get you out, you know, under circumstances that you don't control at that point versus you having control over showing up to that court date. Um, I would say additionally, in terms of speaking culturally, you know, if I'm in court and, and this is historically back to the day when, when I first started as a lawyer, if I saw anyone Latino in court that didn't speak English and the interpreter wasn't there yet, I would do my best to try to help out in terms of helping that person get what they need or whatever help that they need. In some cases, I actually would, uh, would serve as a translator, you know, and, and, you know, selfishly that built up some goodwill with that judge uh, or those judges, you know, but at the same time, I felt that I was rendering a service to the community that I owe so much to that raised me and cared for me and, and brought me up and allowed me to be, allows me to this day to be in the position that um, I'm in. And fortunately in this age, day and age in 2020, you know, I, I think in most courtrooms, you're going to have that one, brother, sister, Latino, Latina, you know, African-American, Afro-Caribbean, whatever, that's there that has a progressive mindset and is willing to help out and that you can ask questions uh, to and, and get some questions answered, you know, but please don't don't just not show up. Don't, don't not deal with it. You can go to court and say, listen, judge, I know I got this obligation, but I, I, I can't pay it right now. Can I pay some of it now and pay it later? Can I get more time? I don't know if I've ever, ever seen someone come to court and ask for more time and the judge doesn't give it to them unless this is like the fifth time they're doing that. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and also it, you get to put it on the record that, look, 
listen, this is the reason, the specific reason I'm not able to fulfill this obligation that I have. Ah, the ah, that, that, that's, that, that's exactly what I'm talking about right there. Ed. That's exactly what I'm talking about. We have to stop being afraid, attorneys and others, to bring our human life experiences to the forefront of the court and to the judge. Any argument I'm making, I'm making it on legal and cultural grounds because they do not know it even exists. And so there's nothing wrong with telling the judge I would love to pay you, Judge. I would love to get this obligation off of my back. It would be one less thing that I can pay and money I can use to feed my family. But unfortunately, I can't find a job. Unfortunately, uh, someone is ill. Unfortunately, sometimes I have to make a choice between paying the court and actually paying for my child's tuition because I like a better future for them. When you start with those tools coming out of your mouth and laying it, when you say on the record, that means a court reporter is writing this down and putting a judge in a position where their humanity has to come first and leave their discretion or in a pretextual stop where you know it's classism or this quota or this prejudice or is racial profiling and you start with that and you let them know that nobody's above that and they need to see that, then you start from a whole different data point that they could never start from. That's why I'm always astonished when it comes down to false arrest, police brutality, excessive force cases, that people of color is not representing people of color because nobody can tell that story better than the person that's been victimized by it. And who is a person of color? But, you know, I mean, that's something that's been ingrained in our community and we've been brainwashed that we need to go other places to seek vindication and representation. And that's not the reality because you walk in the streets and I'm walking the streets and we know two friends who know two friends and so on and so on who practice in law or who's an accountant, who's an investment banker, who's an electrician, who's an optometrist, who's a, uh, you know, pediatrician, you name it. And, 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 and I want to point something out. A lot of times, uh, well, well, not a lot of times, one of the legal basics is when, when a court makes an order, if you don't follow that order, the, the term is contempt. However, one of the elements of contempt is the ability to follow the order. And that's why I was talking about making the record, because if you're ordered to make some sort of payment, and you don't have the ability to do that, then that's what you should put on the record. And that will sometimes tie the hands of a judge to say, damn, I can't, might not be able to find him in contempt because he made a clear record as to why he doesn't have an ability to follow this order. So, so I just want to give you that legal tidbit there in terms of what some of the, 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 the hidden superpowers that you have when, when you, decide that, look, listen, I'm going to deal with this head on. I'm going to show up for court. You know, I, I'm scared about what's going to happen, but this, this, you know, those are one of the tools you got there. And one of the things, one of the things that you're speaking to, which we've been advocating from a victim, from a victim standpoint and from a citizenry standpoint with Black Lives Matter uh, throughout and even before uh, any of the cases that have hit social media is transparency. And so if we're asking for transparency, then we could walk in that courtroom and be transparent because that's who we are and that's what we can do. And that's what we need to say to create that record. And, yeah. and, 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 and that's, that's, that's just the way we should go. Now, now, now let's talk now, since we're talking about money, obligations and orders, Let's talk about these $50 fines. What's going yeah, on? Yeah, you got, you got a 50 spot for me, baby? I need something. You know, can you let a brother hold something, man? Can I got my hand on something? my face. I don't have a mask. Yo, I'm you know what? about what's, what's going to happen when they start giving out these fines and what type of interactions this is going to produce? Because when we started, when we first started this show months ago, the hot topic back then was the, the, the police walking around the city enforcing the COVID-19 restrictions coming down from the governor by executive order. 
and you know, folks saying, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. Why are you coming to me? And that creating some really absolutely sad encounters between police and citizen. And, and I'm just uh, afraid to think what's going to happen when you know you have the person with the mask on the mouth instead of the nose. Do they get well, a well, not, not only that, not only that, not only that. Here we go again, right? I'm gonna plug it one more time and say it one more time. Cardiac arrest, a tactical guide on how to handle unlawful police stops. What do we talk about? The quota cop, right? Oh, you don't have your mask on. I write you a ticket. That's a quota. I'm gonna write a certain amount of tickets before this month is out for those that don't have a mask. That's what I'm going to do all day, every day. That's what I'm going to look for, right? And then speaking back to you, say the circular disadvantage of the criminal justice system. Well, if you're writing tickets for people that don't have their mask on during the day, that means those people are out in the street. And if they're out in the street, are they working or are they just moving? And if they're just moving, that means they're not working. That means they probably don't have the $50 to spare to pay that fine which goes back to accountability and lack thereof. If I don't have the 50 spot, I ain't going to the spot, which is the court. <laughs> now you ain't got the 50 spot, so you don't go to the spot. And later on, if you ever get arrested or detained and that warrant comes up, now you're going to the other spot because of that failure to pay, which means you got a warrant. So I don't know how many spots you want to go to. I want to go to the spot with my man Red Alert and Tommy Allen and a couple of others, DJ Clue, DJ Clark Kent, and spinning the records. I ain't got time to go to this other spot that we're talking about. So you got the $50 fine here in New York. You got the $100 fine in Connecticut. I'm sure Jersey is settling around about 75 You know, they're going to make that money because that's what they do because it's about money. So let's let's go back to Kia made a comment earlier and she said that everyone should have a lawyer, firm, or retainer just in case. Absolutely. Oh my God, did we not talk about this in cardiac arrest? I mean, like, what are we talking about here all day, every day? And just to define what we mean by retainer, I'm telling you from my perspective and from every perspective. That doesn't mean that you necessarily have to have money down. We're not saying give us $200, give us $2,000, give us $5,000 so we can put in an account just so when you call us. What we're saying is that have a relationship. That's what we mean by retainer. Have a relationship. Have the have a relationship. Hold on, Mr. Russell. Have a relationship with someone that looks like you has walked the walk. Yeah, yeah, definitely. definitely. So it's not just have a relationship. I know there are numerous attorneys, but they're attorneys that know and understand what you're living and what you're experiencing that can speak in the courtroom to the cultural that understand because they too may have been pulled over for no reason. They too may have had an unlawful stop. They too may have family members who have experienced what we're talking about. So when you have someone that's from your community, they understand exactly how to advocate and fight for justice for you. So that was a great point. Yes, it's mentioned in cardiac arrest. You have two attorneys here that they can give counsel, they can talk to you and retainer doesn't always mean monetary. The money part, they will tell you lawyers are not cheap, but it's worth the investment on the front end so that you don't have to worry about what it looks like on the back end if you end up in one of these serious cases. So with that being said, I'm gonna let both of you give your final comments. Our show goes so fast, there's so much information. We're praying for Mr. Walker and his family and the recovery, the trauma that we're all experiencing again seeing this play out in the media. Let's not just let the news sensationalize what is a serious problem in America. We can no longer just talk and lament and go through the agony. We have to see change. Change can happen in a variety of ways. We don't have to be married to the process. Let's just be married to the outcome of reform, that it has to happen. It has to happen now. 2020 cannot end without the laws on the books shifting and changing so that we can have a more fair and equitable world that we live in, especially here in the United States. So over to you, Senor Edward Picharo Esquire. My amigo. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Um, I just like to say to everybody, thank you for listening in today. I hope you found the information 
informative. Um, I echo Dr. Grant's sentiments. I heard about the trauma that Mr. Walker's children experienced watching him being assaulted and that his young son is now isn't able to sleep properly, you know, wakes up in the middle of the night with bad dreams as was being stated by his mother to a uh, reporter uh, during an interview earlier. Um, you know, it's just tough to watch, but hopefully, you know, we take in the uh, motto uh, or the or the saying, all politics are local and start focusing on our local politics in order to change the system, watching who we elect as judges, you know, look out there for those sheriff elections where applicable. Um, there are a couple of district attorney races that are happening that we need to pay close attention to because that all that makes a big difference as well. You know, putting pressure on these mayors and these municipal executives to, you know, hire the right police chiefs to, you know, uh, render justice in our communities. You know, we have to pay attention to these things. So you know, farewell and adios. And Mr. Russell. Well, you know, I can't really follow up what Ed said. All I can do is support what both of you have said. I mean, and we're gonna say it all, all over and again and again. You have our contact information here. You know, I could be reached at 718-785-8890, 718-785-8890. And not only do I give this information so you can build a relationship with me, you can build a relationship with Ed, but, Building relationships can lead to further investment in yourself. If I don't know something, maybe I know somebody that knows something. And let's move away from the stereotypes as as I was a victim of in the barbershop real quick. Guy said to me as he was leaving, I was introduced as an attorney. The person did not say what area I focus on. The brother came, you know, gave me a fist bump and said, I hope I never need your services in court. And I said to him, why do we have to be in the courtroom? Why can't we be in the boardroom? And I hope to see you in the future. And he understood and we exchanged because he understood the stereotype that he was throwing down and the misstep. And we were able to make that exchange of information. So as we sit here today and we give the information, it's not all about the courtroom. It's about the boardroom. And so I'll see you in the breakout room because I'm breaking out. <laughs> One quick question before we wrap up. Kia wanted to know about preparing trust. And I just want you to clarify the area of law that you both focus in, criminal, civil, uh, and immigration law. But I know sometimes attorneys can have referrals for those who do. Is this a states and trust? Kia, I'm not sure. But you can contact both of them at the law office, right. at law office of edwardpachardo.com and royserussell.com. Set up an appointment to get that information. I want to thank you, Shawnee, Kia, Richard, Franklin, Deborah. Who else was hanging out with us today? If we're not seeing you, just want to thank you for being a part of our show, for being so engaged in the conversation. For oh my God! Oh my God! I forgot to mention, which, you know, when they say "see something, say something," I got to report this crime. The homicide oh, that happened oh. last night with the Clippers. That was a straight up homicide. <laughs> <laughs> we had to go talk about the Clippers. We couldn't was, end the show without talking about the Clippers. Bro. Self-inflicted homicide there. Was that suicide? Uh, it's called murder Murray right there. Yeah, it was suicide or a homicide. What was going on with that? <laughs> they they <laughs> seem to say something, you know. So I saw something and I'm saying something. You know? <laughs> We're just gonna go read something and mean something before they come up against those Lakers right now. But you know, that's another story. Uh, but, uh, yeah, yeah. No job there. It was straight uh, you know, asphyxiation, you know, we gotta help somebody. <laughs> Okay, you got it out. You feel good now. That you feel wonderful. Oh, my goodness. Family, this is what it is. We're the legal beast of culture. Clearly, we're ending on the cultural note. Thank you so much for being here. We'll be back next week, Wednesday, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You can catch the replays on any of our pages. Also on our Destiny Designers TV YouTube, you can catch all of our shows. So we'll be back. Stay safe. Remember, wear your mask. The fines are coming. So be careful and know that COVID-19 is still out here on a serious note. We're still losing people. So be safe, be well, use your voice for good. And we'll be back again with Speaking Legally. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>